All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started now. Thank you all for being here. My name is Dylan McDowell, and I'm the ex Executive Director of NCEL. It's really exciting to be with you all today for our 2024 Legislative Session Recap. Now, we release the Session Recap annually, but this is our first event geared at giving you the first look at the Session Recap and diving into some of the trends and biggest policy wins we saw this year. We expect this to be an annual thing and something that we hope you'll tune into year, and year after year. Next slide, please. So I'll start with the basics of who is NCEL. We are a nationwide network of over 1,200 state legislators from 50 states and both major parties, and we're a resource on all things environment. We like to say we serve as remote environmental staff. Many legislators don't have a lot of staff capacity, time, and resources, and we try and help legislators by serving as a hub for them to connect with their peers, experts, and resources across the country on a range of environmental issues. We host national, regional, and other events throughout the year and webinars like this, so we hope you'll stay connected. Our work is divided up through four program areas, climate and energy, conservation, environmental health, and oceans, and we weave environmental justice topics throughout all of those. In each of these program areas, we host events, but we also track a lot of bills. So in 2024 alone, we tracked over 2,200 bills in 47 states. You might ask, why not 50? A handful of states actually don't meet every year. And in addition to that, you have some states where there's, where there's limitations on even year sessions. So it might be fewer bills introduced, shorter time frames. Despite that, we saw incredible momentum on the environment, even in the shorter even year. Just some highlights that I'll highlight that I'll share now, an increase in attention on transmission and utility policy, we saw a growth in emerging energy technologies like geothermal being considered. Bills continued to press forward on innovative pesticide regulations. States were working to make the most of federal funding for conservation efforts. And there was exciting new right to repair legislation and the Oregon sponsor will be joining us shortly. And there was continued growth and development of the offshore wind industry. Those are just some of the many trends and you'll hear about more from our program team shortly. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Hawaii State Senator and NCEL President Chris Lee to talk about some of the work happening at the state level. Senator Lee, over to you. Thanks, Dylan. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Lee. I'm a state senator from Hawaii. Uh, very fortunate to uh, chair the board of NCEL and work in partnership with the team, as well as all our partners throughout the country in legislative chambers uh, from coast to coast and beyond. And you know this year in particular is really exciting because as the presidential election uh, and and elections around the country heat up, the energy at the state level I think that that state legislators are feeling has equally ramped up. Um, maybe as a result of the campaigns, but I think more so talking with colleagues as a result of this uh, realization that you know no matter what happens in the elections, no matter who wins the White House or Congress, the bottom line is. States are where the action is, and states are where we're going to have to take um, considerable steps to put in place policies and, and uh, projects and funding and all the things that we need to take next steps on um, all the different issues before us right now. And, you know, a really good example of this is, is around the country um, here in the United States, we have uh, a lot of efforts going on toward uh, clean energy and, and uh, climate and all of that reducing carbon emissions, reducing pollution. But the bottom line is there is no big giant federal target for that. There is nothing that says comprehensively, this is what we're gonna do uh, to get uh, to, to the end goal. Uh, yet today, a majority of Americans live in communities with 100% renewable energy uh, targets or carbon neutrality, economy-wide um, goals. And that's because 24 states plus DC and Puerto Rico and numerous other uh, jurisdictions out there at the local level have taken steps to put in place those laws and those policies directing that transition. And that's what's really been leading the country and driving a lot of the uh, political capacity to move and actually create an environment in which you can have the right kinds of investment, the right kinds of projects, and really the right kinds of results that we've been seeing as states around the country have made progress, um, creating new jobs and lowering costs, and, and of course, reducing emissions and creating safer environments for people to live in. And that's something that's really exciting. And you know, when we talk about this, it's not just this issue area, right? As Dylan had mentioned, it's pesticides, it's conservation, it's habitats, it's invasive species, it's all the things out there that affect 
each of our communities and the economies that those communities are often based upon, which are tied inextricably to the environment, to the land, to our resources, to the way we do things. And so in addition to just those, um, this really impressive laundry list of bills that I think a lot of state legislators around the country have been collaborating together to work on that have already passed this year. Um, you know, we're already prepping for next year. And we know that it's going to be states where we're going to have to move. Uh, we just had our annual forum, which I'm sure others are going to talk about shortly, where we brought together legislators from around the country in person to discuss really what those next steps look like. We had uh, folks from uh, the, the White House, from the administration, from other uh, expert um, agencies and, and NGOs and stakeholders sharing what's going on. We actually launched a new partnership this year with uh, the University of Hawaii, which would be the first of a number of universities and institutions that can directly tie their research and data and science uh, into the political process, into decision-making and policy-making around the country, which is so important because we need to be able to make decisions that are effective and are based on the best data and the best available science and everything else. But most impactful of all, I think, is beyond that, actually having legislators be able to share with one another peer to peer in a way where you can understand the politics, the strategy, the messaging, all the numerous variables that go into actually taking an idea and turning it into actual passable policy and getting it done. That's something that, you know, only legislators who are in the trenches working in this moment, in this time, understand all the moving parts about and to be able to share that with another legislator in a way that you can understand that they've been there in the trenches passing to fight this. And these are the battles and challenges and barriers they've had to overcome and share those stories firsthand can go further than, you know, any amount of um, academic or, or other sort of like, here's, you know, the, the um, outline of a policy and model legislation, just go do it. Right. It transcends that and provides a meaningful uh, collaboration and path forward to actually getting the stuff in place. And that's something that is just so invaluable. And right now, you know, time is is of the essence. We, we face more challenges throughout the country and, and throughout the world right now than, than we have in uh, quite some time. You have a federal government that is a great partner and can be a great partner, but also, I think, surrounded by politics that make it unreliable and, again, put the ball back in the court of the states to really take action. And most of all, you know, we've had this past year and, and recently a number of uh, decisions throughout courts and the Supreme Court that have begun to change not only the role of the federal government and the way it makes decisions, but sends a lot of that authority and that responsibility uh, in practice back to the states, right? restricting the federal agency's ability to use data and science and some of that decision making when it comes to environmental protections or clean air or water or all these things. And so now the bottom line is, uh, you know, it's it's up to the states to step up and fill that gap and take action where it's needed to make sure that we're going to have uh, all the same, I think, goals in our communities that we have set out to accomplish together for, for generations and continue that legacy of being able to adapt and take action when necessary to protect the public, to ensure a sound economy, a clean economy going forward, to create new jobs and do all the things when we think about the environment and conservation that, that overlap inextricably. And you know, the real world impact, like when you, when you talk to folks day to day, often, especially this time in this moment, right, where, where national politics is so on the front burner, everyone's focused there. I think we, we see that in our news feeds and social media and everything else. But when you wake up as a regular person in the morning and you get out of bed, you know, what kind of roads you're driving on, what kind of schools your kids go to, what kind of jobs and healthcare are available, what kind of environment we're going to have, what kind of parks and conservation and efforts we're going to have to protect those species that make our unique communities what they are. That is all decided by and large like 90% at the state and local level. And that's why it's so important that right now, when the ball has been thrown into the court of state legislators, uh, we step up to the plate collectively and take action we need. 
And there are 50 states out there, right? I mean, everybody's going to be doing their own thing for their own purposes, but there's so much of it that overlaps and the politics and the messaging and the collaboration, most of all, can transcend state lines and help people understand how to do these things, even though they might look a little different state to state. And you can try different things in each state because there's 50 of them, create different solutions that can be um, tried and tested and proven and figure out what states are doing it best. What are those best practices, those best policies that are most effective, and then be able to share that with colleagues so they can be replicated around the country and every community can have and see the same success that the best ones are right now. So the ball is definitely in the court of the states and state legislators. The future is the states to shape. And I think this is a time to really step up. And that's why it's so exciting to see so many state legislators come together to focus, to collaborate, and ultimately prepare for this coming year and the years to come to protect our environment, our communities, our future for our next generation. So it's an honor to be a part of that. It's an honor most of all to, to work with so many of the champions out there um, at, and state legislatures, uh, Democrat, Republican, coast to coast and all around uh, to do this. So thank you, Dylan, uh, and look forward to a good conversation today. Thank you so much, Senator Lee, for those wonderful words and just for your leadership, both in the Hawaii legislature and then also across the country through NCEL. With that, let's go into some of the details and some of those incredible trends and policies and movement we're seeing. I'm gonna turn it over to our program teams um, to share some of those program specific highlights. As we go through though, I encourage you all to use the Q&A feature to ask questions and our team can respond to some, but we'll also save some questions for the end when we have our panel with legislators as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ava Gallo, who is our Climate and Energy Manager. Hi folks, thanks so much for joining us today for our session recap. I'm gonna highlight just a couple of trends we've seen this session, but as you all know, Climate energy is a huge um, umbrella of a lot of different policies. So I encourage you to check out the session recap for lots more trends and updates that have happened this session. Um, if you're unfamiliar, in our climate energy program, we center around three pillars of power, transportation, and buildings. Um, in power, we have transmission, grid, renewable energy, and utility policy, transportation, anything from electric vehicles to public transit to bikes and pedestrians. And then a lot around decarbonizing buildings as well, but we touch on everything from adaptation, coastal resilience, anything like that you have a question about, we're here to answer it. So on the next slide, I'm going to highlight our first trend um, on transmission, which is starting to be a very popular topic for states to engage on. Um, I think that it became really evident that um, some of the federal legislation that has passed, the IRA, the infrastructure law, create great incentives for clean energy development. But clean energy development isn't worth a lot if you can't get it attached to the grid and get that energy to where people are using it. And that's where transmission comes in, a piece that was not addressed in either of those pieces of federal legislation for the most part. Um, and so a lot of that jurisdiction is in the federal government, but there is a lot states can do. So I've been really highlighting grid enhancing technologies as a great solution that states have authority over. And so I think of it as the energy efficiency of transmission lines. You may have heard that it can take up to two decades to get a transmission line permitted, cited, funded, all the way to getting electrons through that line. So we need to speed that up and that's another side of the equation, but there are ways that we can enhance the capacity of already existing lines without having to go through new permitting. Um, and that's through grid enhancing technologies or GETS, one of the better acronyms, very good for puns and such. Um, and so it's very much this low hanging fruit policy um, that allows you to get more bang from your buck of the lines that are already there and already on disturbed land. Um, so legislation in both Minnesota and Virginia passed this session to um, make that a little bit easier for uh, to get on the lines. And so that's not necessarily um, incentivized with the utility business model because Utilities um, receive a rate of return on big infrastructure projects that they built. And because grid enhancing technologies fall under more of that operations energy efficiency category, 
um, it's not something that utilities are generally incentivized to do. So these pieces of legislation work with utilities to both incentivize and require gets to be considered when there's congestion on existing lines, which has really big economic impacts to the area. So those are two bills there. I'll also just highlight that the that Minnesota bill also incentivizes transmission development along existing rights of way, like highways and train lines, to avoid disturbing private property rights that can get really tricky and disturb thriving communities. So let's go through lines that are already disturbed and make that a little bit easier for everyone. So on the next slide, I'm looking into our second policy trend, which is geothermal. And you hear a lot, what are we going to do when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing? And geothermal is a really clean, renewable resource that addresses that intermittent intermittency issue and is a dispatchable resource, which means it can be used at any time. So a lot of states, you know, I think states in the West really pioneered this. There's a lot of resources there, but it started to expand beyond states like Colorado into states in the East Coast and the Midwest. So Maryland, they have a bill passed that would pilot, that would require pilot geothermal programs. In Minnesota, they created a geothermal planning grant program and a thermal energy working group uh, to identify the regulatory barriers to geothermal, which is pretty tricky to permit because it's so complex, uh, but it's there's a lot of opportunity here for geothermal and a lot of incentives that were created in the Inflation Reduction Act that can support the build out of these projects as well. So we will drop in the chat a um, policy update that we have on some of the legislation that was passed this session. And we also have all the bill tracking on geothermal on our website as well, on the Emerging Technology page. And then lastly, the third trend that I'm gonna highlight is fees on fossil fuel companies, which answers this question that I'm sure you all get all the time. How are we getting the money to pay for climate mitigation and adaptation projects? And so states have taken the step to charge fossil fuel companies a fee for the impacts that they have caused to their states. And that is where they create the pots of funding to address some of the harms. So in Vermont, they passed this polluters pay legislation, which requires fossil fuels to pay the cost of damages associated with emissions. And that goes to some adaptation projects. And in Colorado, they created a fee on oil and gas producers to fund their public transportation through the clean transit enterprise. Um, and I know that a lot of folks in different states are facing um, transportation funding shortfalls. So that's a really great opportunity to create a new funding source. Um, and I will just end it there. There's lots of other trends I could highlight. My contact information is in the last slide. I'll also put it in the chat, but feel free to ask me questions on any of these three policies, and I'm happy to help support any climate energy work. And with that, I'll pass it off to our conservation manager, Kate Burgess. Thanks, Ava. Good morning, y'all. Good to see you. The conservation movement is really changing. Uh, and thanks to the leadership of state lawmakers like you all, conservation is really entering an era that moves beyond the traditional dogma of siloing land, water, and wildlife protection away from climate and energy, like many of those issues that Ava just covered, away from environmental health that Neb Jot's going to cover, away from social justice. Um, so this new era that we've been seeing in state policy really prioritizes using conservation as this intersectional tool for justice, health, climate mitigation, and so much more. Because the data are really showing that when we address the loss of nature, we are also addressing concomitant crises. So simply put, more nature, better outcomes for all. So let's take a look at what states have been doing to center conservation as a tool for health, climate justice, and so much more. So next slide. Um, first, we have pesticides and pollinators. Pollinators are this kind of charismatic microfauna um, that are really critical for sustaining life as we know it. Uh, they contribute what uh, one out of every three bites of food that we eat, um, in addition to billions of dollars to our agricultural revenue every year. However, pollinating species are facing really steep decline, as you might have been seeing in the news, largely due to pesticide use and, and um, also habitat fragmentation. The pesticide use is the biggie. Um, it causes pollinator die-offs, water contamination, and has been linked to chronic health diseases in humans. In fact, right now, there's a near 100% certainty that Literally everybody on this call has pesticides in our blood right now, which is spooky. Um, but it's been a really clear priority for states as evidenced by the 126 bills that were introduced by half of states this year in territories to limit use of toxic pesticides. Um, 21 bills were implemented this year and that's in a short session for many states. Uh, so a couple of bills to highlight. 
And first, I want to give a little bit of, uh, of context, especially for that Washington bill that I'll direct your focus to first. Um, it talks about neonicotinoids. What the heck are neonics? Um, neonics are the world's most widely used class of insecticides. They're extremely toxic to pollinators. Um, just billionths of a gram is enough to kill bees. But they also pose really serious health risks to people with data having linked exposure to adverse developmental and birth defects. And so Washington, that bill on the bottom, um, they passed this bill this year to prohibit a person from using those neonic pesticides on outdoor plants um, and also requires those pesticides to be designated as state restricted use. So it's not a full ban, but it restricts the use, um, which is a step forward. And, and right now, over a fifth of states have some form of neonic restrictions, which is paving the way for other states to act on this issue as well. And then the bill above that is um, about pollinator habitat um, and protection more, more largely. It's a bipartisan bill um, and it adds invertebrates, which includes pollinators, it's a class of species, um, to the list of species that can be studied and conserved under the state's Endangered Species Act. Majority of states have their own state Endangered Species Act to complement the federal one. And if a category of species isn't specifically covered or listed within that state Endangered Species Act, then it gets excluded from key funding that would otherwise be available for habitat protection um, or if the, the habitat gets fragmented or other kind of conservation measures that other listed species get. So this is a big one that other states are starting to pursue as well. It seems little, but so are pollinators and they make a really, really big difference when they're protected. Next slide, please. Next is outdoor engagement. So right now, 25% um, of youth spend zero time outdoors. Yet we know that time outdoors is one of the strongest predictors of health and community resilience. Um, outdoor recreation and education are really keystone policy options for equitable public health outcomes, climate mitigation, restoring public engagement on critical environmental issues. I know that when I am outside, I feel more connected to my environment. I'm more likely to adopt kind of pro-environmental attitudes, and that has been represented in data for many years now. Um, so states are increasingly recognizing the importance of outdoor engagement um, for public health, for climate justice, um, et cetera, through lots of different policies that have been piloted. Um, and we also have a new Outdoors as a Health Solution briefing book that my colleague Grant put together that we'll put in the chat. Highly recommend you check that out. Um, and this year, almost 100% of states, 46 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, introduced 358 bills to increase outdoor access and equity with 64 bills having been enacted. So it's a really big priority. Um, and two that I wanted to highlight is this New Mexico one, which improves the Land and Water Conservation Fund access and equity. Um, it's a That's a big pot of federal money um, that tribes are directly uh, not eligible to get uh, funding. So they have to go through states. And so this bill actually prioritizes tribal nation funding requests and also expands eligibility to rural communities and also provides some assistance for technical um, technical help and outreach. And so it reduces some of the barriers for access for tribes in the state to get federal funding that helps um, promote those outdoor engagement opportunities for people. And the second one is in Colorado that passed and it provides for outdoor preschool licensing um, and also requires the Department of Early Education or Early Childhood um, to develop guidelines for outdoor learning facilities. Why does this matter? Well, one, we know that when kids are outside early, it promotes really great um, pro-environmental attitudes and, and a suite of public health benefits, but also the licensing of outdoor preschools um, promotes uniform safety. It legitimizes them. Um, it provides guidance for small business owners, and it makes outdoor preschools eligible for state and federal programs for in low income families. And Colorado, Colorado right now is the second state to fully provide licensing. So it's developing, uh, demonstrating an early but emerging trend. So last slide, please. Last is habitat connectivity. So the fragmentation of wildlife habitats by roadways and other infrastructure is one of the largest threats to biodiversity and human health worldwide. Um, it disrupts migration routes, limits access to essential resources for wildlife. Um, it also makes collisions with wildlife and vehicles much, much more likely. And so states have been implementing solutions to improve habitat connectivity, to reduce fragmentation and, and expand um, habitat um, through things like wildlife crossings, which help maintain ecosystem resilience and reduce those wildlife vehicle collisions. Actually in 2024, 19 states introduced 44 bills. Um, 12 were enacted. 
And states such as Utah, Washington, and Florida enacted laws to unlock new funding for projects, and others such as Maryland, Maine, and New York introduced laws to improve planning for enhanced habitat connectivity. Um, the one that I wanted to highlight is New Mexico. You might see an allocation of $5 million and say, so what? What's another appropriation? Well, New Mexico has done back-to-back -back appropriations in support of habitat connectivity over the last several years, and this is the largest so far. Started with Senator Stewart um, in 2019, initiating a, a wildlife corridor action plan, which laid the groundwork, it actually came out of an idea from the 2018 NCEL forum. Um, and after that action plan was created, there was a 500K appropriation, then a $2 million appropriation, and now there's this $5 million appropriation to implement some of the recommendations that have been through that action plan. And I'll also say that this action plan in New Mexico has been very intentional about coordinating with tribes. Um, in fact, they helped the Mescalero Apache tribe get $480,000 from a, a federal pot of money for the Wildlife Crossing Pilot Program to do a wildlife vehicle mitigation study that will help meet that goal meet some of the goals of New Mexico's Wildlife Corridor Action Program. So this was a, a big appropriation from Mexico and other states are kind of um, following suit and, and allocating millions and millions of dollars in funding to these projects, working with their state departments of transportation and their environmental and natural resource agencies to make sure that this is a priority uh, for all. So with that, those are some of the biggest trends coming out of conservation. I will pass it to our wonderful environmental health manager, Navjot. Thanks, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to talk to you all today about environmental health. So environmental health has main focuses on environmental justice, plastic pollution, zero waste, toxic chemicals, and sustainable agriculture and water quality. So here are the up trends we see in this session regarding plastic pollution. There were 42 bills this year regarding the right to repair. While Oregon is the fourth state to enact right to repair, this is the first bill that prevents parts pairing, allowing consumers the ability to use unauthorized and third-party parts for electronic devices. Colorado has also enacted right to repair, but expands repair rights to include electronics, but also appliances and other products. This law builds on Oregon's success by emphasizing designing products for easier repair. Minnesota also had a modified version of their EPR bill, which was called the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. This bill requires producers of packaging, paper products, and food service packaging to fund recycling and waste management efforts. By 2032, all packaging must be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And Minnesota was first in the nation to include boat wrap in EPR. Finally, Illinois established that by 2026, all hotels in Illinois may not provide single-use plastic bottles containing personal care products to customers. Last year, Washington was actually the first state to pass a bill targeting single-use plastics in bottles, containers, packaging in lodging like hotels, and plastic foam. This year, actually, many more single-use plastic bills were introduced addressing issues like plastic film, straws, packaging, microfibers, and even creating a working, working groups. And for toxic chemicals, oh boy, we had a lot. And the main one, one of them is about PFAS. So there is an emerging trend amongst legislators from trying to ban PFAS in firefighter foam, artificial turf, sales and products intentionally containing PFAS, and even testing drinking water. Colorado also had a bill preventing the placement of non-functional and artificial turf that contains PFAS that tends to escape in the environment to help the public. And they, Colorado also had a phase-out ban for the sale and distribution of range of products that intentionally contain PFAS. Maryland also had a bill that prevents anyone from installing, selling, and supplying playground surfacing materials that actually contains lead or PFAS that were intentionally added. And actually, there's been an increasing trend this year about PFAS in playground equipment and artificial turf. And it's a big topic of interest, such as Massachusetts introducing four toxic-free kids bills to remove PFAS from turf, fields, and athletic equipment. 
New Jersey also had a few bills passed this session that prohibits the sale, manufacture, and distribution of a firefighter foam that contains PFAS. And they had another bill that requires the state to perform a study concerning the regulation of PFAS substances. Also, there is an increasing trend amongst legislators to ban to ban and have safe disposal of firefighter foam and PPE that contains PFOS. This includes Alaska, California, New York, Illinois, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. Finally, Rhode Island enacted the Consumer PFOS Banned Act of 2024 that prohibits the intentional addition of PFOS in products offered for sale or manufactured in the store in the state. And they had another bill that passed that requires all public water systems in the state to be monitored for PFAS detectable in the standard laboratory methods. Rhode Island and New Jersey are leading in these legislations, while many states are also considering how to do this in their own state. Next slide, please. And finally, cumulative impact. We saw a lot of movement in this area. Legislators are very interested in cumulative impact and excited to work on environmental justice issues. At least 16 states, and including Washington, D.C., introduced 35 bills to address this with pollution. A total of three bills were enacted into law, and the one bill we're going to talk about today is Colorado again. That requires the office to oversee, a, it requires an office of environmental justice, sorry, in the Department of Public Health and the Environment. This would oversee a process to develop at least two environmental equity and cumulative impact analysis for specific geographic locations within the state. Representative Robb in Pennsylvania introduced a bill also to establish an environmental justice policy center and fund to lead research, provide recommendations, and address environmental justice issues. And now I'm going to move it back to Dylan to talk about our oceans program. Thank you, Nabjot. Um, so at NCEL, we also have an oceans program and Alyssa Weinman is our ocean program manager. Unfortunately, she could not be here today. So I wanna highlight a few of the different areas we've been tracking over the last year. The offshore energy transition largely has been a big focus for us, as well as coastal resilience and restoration, the, the nexus between oceans and climate, and then the blue economy efforts around working waterfronts, aquaculture and fisheries. There's a lot of tie-ins among oceans with climate energy, conservation, environmental health, and more. So more to come on this, but I'm going to focus in on some of the offshore wind efforts because that's there's been a lot of media attention, a lot of focus across the country. So we saw a big focus on offshore wind. Um, the offshore wind industry, there was 12 states introducing 33 bills this last year to advance the industry. A total of 11 bills were enacted across eight states. Two that I was going to highlight, there was a theme around the need for increased collaboration and coordination between relevant offshore wind project stakeholders. So in California, there was a bill to establish the Offshore Wind Energy Fisheries Working Group. This includes state and federal agencies, um, fisheries, Native American tribes, and more to develop a straight statewide strategy to minimize offshore wind energy impacts on ocean fisheries. This is a common concern or, um, with offshore wind development, so California is looking to get ahead of that. In Oregon, they've developed the Offshore Wind Energy Roadmap. And so this roadmap is in development. It's gonna provide inroads for effective stakeholder engagement, uh, travel resources, marine environments, and more to really focus on helping these groups work together as this industry develops. Next slide, please. Speaking of workforce development, this was a big theme that we saw come up. So in Virginia, the budget bill authorized funds for the Office, Office of Offshore Wind to collaborate across state agencies on strategies to reduce barriers for deployment of offshore wind and allocates additional funds to support career access and training opportunities. We've seen this conversation come up a lot, thinking about agencies working together, so not things making sure things aren't siloed, and then also making sure we have career access and ready, readiness, which is not always a part of the policy. In Louisiana, there was a Senate resolution to highlight the economic and workforce development potential of offshore wind, and it encourages the state to support, quote, and to lean into existing Louisiana offshore energy leadership. So very exciting to see that happening down in the Gulf. And then finally, in Connecticut, there's another angle. By adding requirements to existing offshore wind procurement authorization to require bidders to contract with state fishermen for support services. 
That includes scouting for fishing gear or serving as safety vessels in, in the lease areas. Another aspect of the Connecticut bill is actually extending the lease terms, the agreement terms from 20 years to 30 years, which will hopefully provide some more th certainty in the long run. Next slide, please. Um, and then I also wanna take a moment to highlight California SB 108, which allocates funding to the Ocean Protection Coalition to support research, monitoring, and adaptive management strategies for offshore wind development to ensure that the environmental and ecosystem impacts are monitored and that they're consistent on the renewable energy goals. This is a big conversation taking place of how to make sure that we have environmental monitoring alongside offshore wind, and California has taken several steps to work at that nexus point going forward. Overall, um, there's a big focus, as I mentioned, on offshore wind, but we do track marine conservation and several other issues. And so I encourage you to look at the full recap, which is going to be available here in the chat in just a moment, and will also be sent out to everyone virtually as well. Um, and reach out to us if you're curious about other ocean-based trends that we can highlight for you. With that, we're going to turn to an incredible legislator panel we have here, so you can hear directly from the folks that are working on these bills on the front lines in their state legislatures across the country. You've already met Senator Chris Lee, who is the NCEL president, as mentioned, from Hawaii. We're also going to be joined by Representative Danielle Friolatin from Pennsylvania. And she also serves as the co-chair of the Pennsylvania Climate Caucus. And we're finally we're joined by Senator Janine Solman from Oregon. Senator Solman was the sponsor of the right to repair legislation we heard about, and she has sponsored many other of the environmental efforts in Oregon. So I will invite all of them to come on camera now, and we have a few questions for them. As they're coming online, I would encourage folks to use the Q&A box to please list any questions you have. Um, you can ask questions for our program team or questions for the lawmakers themselves. Thank you all. I see you, Senator Solman, Representative Friolatin, Senator Lee. Thank you so much for being here. And just, you've done so much. As I mentioned, the short session timeline can be constricting, but all of your states have taken huge strides. I'm gonna start with, um, a high-level question here. of What are you most proud of accomplishing in your state this past session? Senator Lee, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we did was a focus on um, undersea mining in particular, obviously in Hawaii. Our oceans are, uh, uh, you know, everything to us. And so both for fishing, for indigenous um, rights, and certainly environmental protections, uh, because of the unknown science and unknown impacts that this could have on you know, our biggest carbon sink on the planet, which is the Pacific Ocean, um, we, we took a pause and um, prohibited uh, undersea mining of heavy metals and things like that, where you're gonna come in and, and basically sort of strip mine the ocean floor uh, in our waters, and then also barred our uh, ports from being used for that purpose when uh, especially you have uh, illegal foreign activity and things like that. Uh, as well connected to undersea mining. So that's something that um, we've been working with other states on as well, and hopefully uh, can continue the conversation to make sure that we have a, a sound ocean and, and, and good ecosystem and can still take steps toward uh, uh, all things we need to out here in the Pacific. Thank you, Senator. And as you mentioned, we're seeing a lot of interest in the deep sea mining conversation. So I expect that to be a topic that shows up on our recap a year from now. Uh, Representative Friolatin, we'll turn it to you. What is what is something you're most proud of from this last Thank year? Thank you, Dylan. Um, so I would say, so for Pennsylvania in 2022, we very unexpectedly flipped the, the Pennsylvania House um, from red to blue by one seat. And so that has created the only divided legislature in the nation at the, mo at the moment with a Democratic governor. And so um, we have gone from playing defense to playing offense on environmental issues um, in a short period of time. And that, that's been a real big win for us. Um, we've gotten some exciting things through in the last session, um, one being um, the whole home repairs program, which has been extremely successful, um, I believe has been highlighted in some of the NCEL literature. Um, this past uh, budget cycle, we just passed um, Solar for Schools, which is an incentive program um, to help to bring some of the IRA um, investments into the state, but really helping our school districts to 
not only have better cleaner energy um, and more resiliency locally, but also to offset some of the costs that are driving um, property taxes through the roof. So it's a win-win on a lot of fronts. And that just passed um, after two solid years of pushing hard to make that happen. That just passed this past June. And we're really proud of that. And I think for me, the biggest um, the biggest initiative that personally I'm working on um, and that has been, it's one of, I think it has more co-sponsors than any piece of legislation in the caucus. Um, it's definitely more co-sponsors than I've ever had before on a bill that I've offered. I've authored, but um, I am the prime sponsor of the governor's um, Pennsylvania Reliable Energy and Sustainability Standard. Uh, we've been trying to increase our alternative energy portfolio standards since I was elected uh, in, and sworn in in 2019. Um, it expired shortly thereafter. Um, and so we haven't seen a lot of movement in the renewable energy space in Pennsylvania in quite some time. And so um, this bill was really uh, forward thinking, all, all encompass, encompassing, but um, just really smartly done to incentivize the cleanest forms of energy without um, excluding, um, which often causes tension in legislatures like ours. And so there's a little something for everybody in there, but every single thing that, that is in there moves us further forward in a positive direction um, for clean energy in Pennsylvania. So we've gotten a lot of movement on that. We had a couple of hearings over the summer and we're expecting a vote on it in the House next month when we return. So we're super excited about pushing the governor's energy agenda forward here in Pennsylvania and haven't seen movement in that way in the six years I've been in office. So it's a really exciting time in Pennsylvania and we're really looking forward to having some big wins um, next year. Thank you, Representative. And, and you've done a really great job with the Climate Caucus, providing space for education and collaboration among legislators. And I think I know other states have some have standing caucuses, some are still creating them. But Pennsylvania, you all have bylaws and some real formality that I think has helped kind of make sure that there's a lot of learning and education that goes alongside the policy efforts. So just and you guys have been that. super helpful with that. So I appreciate well, that. You. Senator Solman, uh, over to you. Hello. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I am Janine Solomon. I represent uh, Senate District 15 in Oregon. And I would say that um, I am most proud. Um, this is not going to be a surprise to people. If you notice I was at NCEL or NCSL, I had my right to repair t-shirt on because I could not, I cannot be more excited about right to repair for consumer electronic items that we were able to pass in a five-week session in Oregon uh, last session. Now it's not the first time that we have brought that forward. Um, that bill is the fourth time. So the first time it encompassed a lot of things. Uh, second, third, and fourth, it was narrowed to consumer electronic items and small appliances that had um, a consumer, a, a, a digital component to it. And I think what I'm really excited about is the partners that came together at the table. Uh, it, there is no there is no me in this. It was a big team effort. And uh, we had really great advocates for Environment Oregon, from, um, our U, our, from US PERG and OSPERG, as well as we had Apple at the table. Um, and, no, I apologize. We didn't have Apple at the table. We had Google at the table. We invited Apple to the table, but they don't tend to come to the table. Um, and uh, so we had industry. We also had Technology Association of Oregon um, on board. And then we were able to turn a lot of folks and industry that had been in opposition to the neutral or support space. Um, we have a strong belief. Or I have a strong belief when you have policy, you bring people together that are opposed and in support of policy. And uh, some people really chose to come and we rolled up our sleeves and we worked. And this bill, essentially, we kept to the core of this was about saving families money. It was about supporting small businesses in Oregon. It was about reducing the e-waste, um, cutting pollution, because 80% of the energy in a phone is in the manufacturing of that. And so we want to make sure that we have those items last longer. And it was also about closing the digital divide. We learned during COVID that 75,000 students in Oregon were without laptops. And so we needed to figure out how we would get them secondhand equipment 
quickly, um, affordably, um, so that they can continue to do their schoolwork and such. And so we're really excited that this passed um, through Oregon. And I will say um, it has been billed as the most comprehensive right to repair bill. Um, although I would say Colorado has the most broadest um, because they have tractors and wheelchairs and now consumer electronics. But in Oregon, we did address the parts pairing issue that seems to be something that has come forward um, at, from one particular company that I may have mentioned earlier. Um, and so they um, that is something that we were able to take on in this policy. So it really was about protecting consumers and allowing them the choice. If they own a product, they should be able to know where, how, and how much they're going to spend to get that product repaired. So really proud of the effort. 25 to 5 vote out of um, the Senate, 43 to 13, I believe, out of the House, bipartisan. We had bipartisan supporters. We had, um, you know, uh, sponsors on the bill. And uh, please message me for anything. Senate Bill 1596. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. And I just want to note two things or kind of pull out two things you said, because some of the folks in the audience here are, are not all state legislators. This one's open to our full network. And so one piece is just how you worked on this for many years. And also you mentioned your work with Colorado. And I just think that's so important in such a great example of legislatures and, and legislators like yourself, where you're part-time, you're working with folks, having conversations with um, other legislators in other states and building on each other's policy to keep expanding, keep growing, which is fantastic. And then also is the time aspect. You mentioned the short session. For folks that don't know, um, Oregon has roughly a six month session during the odd years and then a 35 day session during the short years. And so it is a very, very short session and I think a real testament to the work you did and it shows a lot of the need to kind of bring together those coalitions in, ahead of sessions. So just thought that was worth noting because I, I think you've done a great job of, of really working on that. So looking ahead into 2025, I, I wanted to ask you all what you think some of the biggest issues or topics are gonna be, and especially how you see the intersection between state and the federal government, whether that's continued IRA funding or other elements where you hope to kind of keep pushing the needle on some of these environmental issues. Um, I'll let anyone who wants to go first start on this one. I'll... Oh, All right. do you want me to go ahead? Because I was at the end. So I'll start it out at the beginning. And I would just say, um, first of all, Dylan, thank you so much for saying that, because I want to say the importance, the importance of us working together. It's work smarter, not harder. Look at what the hurdles are. Understand what people faced, um, other legislators faced in other states um, as the barriers. And, and that's what's something I really appreciate about NCEL and the staff, how they can provide that that bridge, um, but also just the, the folks that you meet when you go to these conferences and you know that you can reach out to them and talk to them. So how incredibly important that is. And then briefly, what I think is going to, we're going to see coming forward um, is transmission uh, in energy. Um, you know, um, we, I appreciated being invited by NCEL to learn more about that in the Spokane area we recently went to. Um, but that, that is something that is not a strength of mine, but certainly my colleagues bring that strength. And I will lean on NCEL as the chair of Senate Energy and Environment, as well as my colleagues to really, and, and, and the colleagues that are on this call to really learn from them. Um, but we really need to be collectively working on this together um, at multi-state. So I think the transmission, I also think what we're hearing is um, from constituents are about the, um, the rate hikes. And that's not an Oregon um, uh, issue. Um, as pointed out from the representative from Pennsylvania, um, you know, uh, energy costs and the rate hikes, that is something that is going to continue to be in a conversation point. We have just now uh, our, our energy, um, our PGE, our local investor owned is asking for another 10.5% rate hike and consumers and constituents are, are talking about it. So um, those are some of the issues that I think are going to come forward, as well as in Oregon, we're going to look at um, the right to repair wheelchair and we'll lean heavily on Colorado um, to learn from them uh, as we bring that policy forward. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. I can jump in on that. And thank you, Senator. I, I think jumping off of what you said, um, 
I think we've done this really good job of generating market forces through I IJA and IRA um, to push um, the, the renewable energy sector forward, right, and create that demand. We're seeing demand both from, um, like I say, in Pennsylvania all the time because we haven't gotten there yet, but all of our surrounding states are going to renewable energy standards that are very, very ambitious. And um, and then in addition that, to that, we have uh, our corporate uh, citizens who are also adopting, um, you know, energy standards for their own uh, their own businesses, and that and that's become a factor in what states businesses want to locate in, and um, and so we've done this really great job of generating market forces, and that has now created this new challenge of transmission and grid grid enhancements, and how are we gonna onboard all of this investment onto a grid and make that grid more reliable. Um, we're going to see this enormous growth of demand um, due to a lot of it being like crypto mining and data centers, which we've seen over the years become a, a you know, just like a big force in, in, in our communities. Um, and so actually one of the successes in Pennsylvania was that we um, we have blocked crypto mining from our um, tax credits so that we're not incentivizing more energy demand while we're still trying to ramp up production. And so I think that goes to the rate hikes, right? So supply and demand, the more demand there is for energy and the less supply there is for energy, the higher the rates are going to go. And so we have this enormous need at this point to just onboard more energy sources um, and renewables, 90% of what's in the PJMQ right now is renewable energy. So um, we know that new renewable energy is the future. Um, and, and I think this work on transmission and grid, grid enhancements and grid reliability is going to be the most important work we do going into 2025. And thank you to Ava, because you've done such a good job of educating legislators on this. I say all the time, six years ago, it was a marketing director. I didn't, knew nothing about grids. I knew there was one, but I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> and I've been able to like learn my letters and then make words and then make sentences and then make paragraphs and now be able to um, talk fluently on these issues. Um, and talk, speaking of working together, Delegate Sharkudian has been such a great um, resource and mentor to those of us who are coming into the space and learning. And I've just really, really um, been grateful for her leadership in this space and, and the opportunity through NCEL to work with her. Thank you so much. Um, and second that, that Ava has done an incredible job. There are no shortage of acronyms in the energy space, that is for sure. Senator no, uh, no, no, just just on that for a sec. It's really funny because that's the value I think that that having this sort of peer-to-peer -peer discussion um, in this network really brings to the table. Because you know when you when you get elected as a brand new legislator, you don't have like this really broad depth of knowledge about everything which everyone expects of you. And I remember when I was first elected, like trying to figure out like what's an electric grid. I mean, it's like the matrix. You know, it's there. It, it touches you every day, but you can't quite explain what it is and how it works. But um, but you know, I, I think I think this coming year in particular, uh, I mentioned this in the in the beginning. One of the things we're starting to see are a number of lawsuits um, move their way through various courts and circuits, and with the uh, couple of new Supreme Court decisions setting new precedent, I think the outcomes uh, around the country that um, uh, are are likely to to move forward uh, will significantly impact clean water, clean air standards, you know, all the basic stuff, I think that too often our communities um, rely upon, but but I think forget about and take for granted because we've had federal protections for, you know, generation or more on some of these things that now is being uh, pushed to the states. And so if we're going to be able to get ahead of some of these things that could um, create real, uh, you know, blow ups in, in various communities, um, rural, urban, conservative um liberal or so on, kind of across the board, you know, we are all going to have to collaborate to do some of these things. And I think that's where there's going to be some focus to figure out, all right, what do we do at the state level to help put in place protections that are um, are necessary going forward? And and what's really exciting about this is, you know, and this this is perhaps part of the, the I think, the best um, experience that I've had uh, for many years, uh, you know, working with other legislators and, and NCEL staff and others 
in these kinds of discussions is that these solutions and and, and the sort of approach to all of this doesn't have to be partisan. And you know, we we can work together across the aisle, especially when it's peer to peer like this and not you know in front of a whole bunch of uh, cameras trying to trying to score political points. Because we're all focused on the same stuff at the end of the day, right? We want clean energy jobs. We want investment. We want uh, an environment that is good for the people that live in our communities. Uh, and, and how we get there, I think, is something we can all generally work together on in ways that is is truly, I think, bridging and, and circumventing the political polarization divide that we see too often. I think we assume too often exists in places around the country and certainly in D.C., and just a really good example of that, and I can speak most, I think, um, articulately about Hawaii because it's obviously where I'm from. But but two big bills that we we passed, um, I think, exemplify the kinds of outreach across the aisle and collaboration and and education, all those things working together. One was in 2018 when we passed our um, our, our directive to have a, a carbon negative. Um, uh, Target you know economy wide by 2045 consume more uh, greenhouse gas emissions than our economy produces. Uh, we did that not only um, with support of both our chamber of commerce and labor and environmental groups and industry and all of that kind of together at the table, but we did it bipartisan in a way that when it passed, um, it passed unanimously, and that's something that you know is a, is a long road to set up, but clearly can be done. And those are some of the the um, lessons and and narratives and how to collaborate that can be shared state to state because fundamentally you know we all are driven by I think the same sort of primary motivators we want to do good for our communities right everybody's thinking about elections and how that's going to impact our caucuses and what we're able to do so through the lens of all of that you know there is a path to collaborate and and just in the undersea mining thing I just mentioned you know that was passed here unanimously so there there are ways to bring people together. And that I think is perhaps the biggest thing coming up this year because I think everybody understands we have to work together and we need to be able to uh, sit at a table together and have these discussions and come up with practical, pragmatic solutions in ways that uh, simply isn't possible, I think, without the kind of collaboration and and, and safe spaces that uh, networks like this and, and others create. Thank you so much, Senator Lee. And I see we do have a question. I was, um, and Senator Solomon, I'm going to ask if you could help respond to this as well. Uh, it was a question about states that uh, basically policies to address plastic pollution and enhanced collection infrastructure for, for recyclable materials. And I was just starting to type it out, but I'll just say verbally, this is an area we're seeing a lot of momentum. I think right to repair is a really big part of that, of making sure we're reusing and finding circular economy there. We're also seeing a lot of approaches around EPR systems and as well as deposit return systems, bottle bills, Oregon being the oldest bottle bill, but many other states having that. And there's been a lot of variety in the EPR systems that have been enacted, whether it's Maine or Colorado, now Minnesota, Oregon. And so trying to take those lessons learned and go beyond just the single use plastic bands, i.e. bags, um, to have more of those systemic changes that really look at the circular economy holistically. Senator Solman, you've been on the front lines of that and bringing in topics like or uh, right to repair. Just in our last minute here, is there anything you would add on that um, in terms of the types of policies we're seeing? Well, again, I think that with Senate Bill 582 out of Oregon, our EPR policy, it's that what we looked at is we looked at the continuing an amount of waste that is being produced and who is paying for that to be disposed of. And it was coming back to the ratepayers. So in Oregon, we had to look at how do we flip that to put that to the people who are producing the waste with the less impact on Oregonians and constituents. And so I think we're, we're right now we're in the we're in the rulemaking phase of that. But ultimately, um, I will tell you one of the comments that one of my colleagues said to me is because they called this the re. Um, a remodern a modernization of our recycling act and one of my colleagues says you know janine i'm a little frustrated they talk a lot about reduce and reuse and not as much about recycling and i was like and the problem is <laughs> because really that's what we need to do and we need to flip that narrative about it's not just about producing producing and recycling it it's what are we doing to reduce the waste in the first place how are we reusing things in a in a market 
right to repair. And then, and then at the last aspect of that is if it cannot, you cannot use the first reduce, reuse, how can it be recycled? And so that's really what we're looking at. And I'm really proud of the work there. Um, I'm actually going into a meeting right now to talk about that. But um, I think those are, it, it's important for us to, to shift that mindset away from just recycling and how do we get something and how, how is it, how are we reducing the waste in the first place? Fantastic. Well said. And I think the last thing I want to end on is that it's all connected. As we've heard about today, all of these topics, whether you're talking about recycling, you're talking about producer responsibility, energy systems, production of plastics, wildlife connectivity and habitat, it all comes together. And our goal at NCEL is to find those connections and help legislators understand that and really be working towards that healthier environment for everyone. I want to give a huge thank you to all three of you for joining us and sharing your expertise and talking about your work. Um, we will send out a recording and a full session recap to folks. It's also in the chat, but please reach out um, and thank you all once again for your work, for your leadership, and we are so excited to track the work you're doing in, into the next session. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.